Hey guys, Rachel Brinke from The Law Talk here, and today I'm so excited that because I have Andrew Connors, who actually we graduated law school a couple years apart, but from the same school, and he is also my trademark attorney. He focuses on intellectual property and business litigation, and so we're going to talk a little bit with Andrew today about one of the big questions I always get from you guys, and it's about something called the cooling off rule. If you don't know much about it, I think Andrew's going to give us a little insight into it, but I really wanted to get a varying perspective uh, and some insight into how this can apply in the course of photography business to make sure that you guys are doing the right thing. Because uh, you know, you come to me, I talk about contracts a lot, but we want to make sure that the sale can follow through and sometimes they can unravel in the days following a sale because of something called the cooling off rule. So Andrew, thank you so much for being here to talk to us about this. And I guess just go ahead and we'll let you kick it off with um, some of the information that you wanted to provide for them. Well, thank you, Rachel. I really appreciate you having me, and I hope I can give your um, your audience some useful information. So, I'm going to focus uh, our my, our discussion today on on two laws that I'm familiar with. So, there's a cooling off rule promulgated by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, under Federal Consumer Protection Act laws. That's going to apply to everybody, no matter what state or territory you're in, so long as you're in the United States. And we'll also discuss so that people have some context, since I'm in Virginia. Um, there's something in Virginia called the Virginia Home Sales Solicitation Act, which is a bit of a corollary to the FTC rule, and I suspect that many states uh, would have something similar. Mm -hmm. So just to, for, for the audience to keep in mind that you have both federal and state compliance, and they might be different. Um, but uh, I guess maybe to lay the groundwork for your audience, Rachel, uh, generally speaking, when you're talking about uh, we were just talking about this offline before we started the interview. Um, there are door-to-door uh, -door sales rules um, that basically uh, are meant to govern door-to-door um, -door salesman-like transactions. For instance, I think of a person selling knives door-to-door -door or something like that. I always think of the vacuum cleaner people. Yeah. <laughs> vacuum cleaners is a perfect example. I think it's pretty clear uh, from my reading that um, that's what legislatures and Congress have. I agree. Worked when they pass these things. However, of course, as we know, as Rachel and I know as lawyers, they, uh, that doesn't mean that's how it will be enforced because the law can be written in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, now, if, if for those that, that care, well, I'll, I'll mention a couple boring uh, legal statutes so people know <laughs> what I'm talking about, but it's good so you can look these up later. So the federal rule is actually a, um, a um, regulation. A regulation means it's something that was passed by a federal agency so it's sort of quasi-law, meaning it has to have some authority. Now, the Federal Trade Commission has a lot of authority to regulate consumer protection things, and they are regulating what they believe to be deceptive or misleading trade practices. So and actually, let me insert there, that's really important that you brought that up because it's not just governing this cooling off rule that we're going to talk about, which basically allows a con may allow a consumer to contract uh, cancel a uh, purchase or a contract within a certain amount of time period. But the FTC also governs the advertising rules that you guys need to be aware of online, offline, because of consumer protection, like Andrew just said. Um, so they're not just the governing body for what we're talking about. They are overarching to protect everyone out there, consumers out there from um, unfair practices. I appreciate that, Rachel, because that's a really good point. In fact, one thing I've commonly talked about, I'll just throw it out there so people are aware, but as an example, other things they might regulate that might be relevant to people uh, in your neck, but are things like endorsements, yes. uh, products, uh, things like, I've dealt with that a lot too. So you're right, it's very overreaching and there are a lot of regulations, both federal and state, concerning what it means to engage in misrepresentation or deceptive trade practice that might be very well intentioned, but mm -hmm. sure enough, you, you might fall under one of these laws. And before we go forward on that, I just wanted to touch on the endorsement thing. Uh, that I go into this a lot more in my marketing course. Obviously, I have a legal section for you guys. It wouldn't be me if I didn't include that. But I t it, when we talk about endorsements, we're talking about use of like testimonials and advertising to gain new clients. And there's issues when, and this can happen if you guys have like senior reps or client referral programs, uh, that if you are paying someone or providing them something in exchange for that endorsement or testimonial, that has to be disclosed to the people that are seeing or reading or receiving the testimonial uh, because it, it, they need to be on notice and let them know that it might taint their 
uh, the, if the testimonial is true, because you're, if you're going to be told that you're given a $25 gift card to Starbucks for a testimonial, you're probably going to be more likely to give it and give a really glowing testimonial. But the whole point in testimonials and trying to get um, new clients is they need to be accurate and truthful, just like we were talking about a minute ago. We don't want these to be misleading practices. Uh, so that's just a little tidbit I want to throw out there for you guys. If you have any more information on that, that's outside the scope what we're going to bring. Uh, but Marketing Madness has that, and there's also some articles up on the blog. So Andrew, that's sorry about that. No, no. no. <laughs> In fact, I suspect it's something, just so you know, I suspect it's something I'll blog about too. We got a little blog. Yes. Oh, yes. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm going to link Andrew's information for you guys. Um, he is the person that I go to if I have any questions as far as um, really in-depth intellectual property uh, trademarks. Like I said, he's my trademark lawyer. He did all the trademarks for me. Um, his blog is a great resource uh, as well. Oh, thank you. Um, but I suppose we should shift over so I get yep. back to the door-to-door -door sales. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, no, it's all right. Um, so um, the, the, I was mentioning code section. So the federal code section is, a, a, like I said, it's a regulation, meaning that um, if you really wanted to get into it, there might be some legal argument out there that this is not a lawful regulation. But let's assume it is. It probably is. And um, that's at um, it's Title 16 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 429. And that defines what uh, type of sales they're going to deal in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not going to read out every, the text is long and boring and you hire people like me to make it a little less. <laughs> um, but, but basically, so it's regulating a sale, lease or rental of consumer goods or services. There's some key criteria there. So, right, so you see immediately any sale, consumer goods or services, probably in most cases, uh, photographers are going to be dealing in consumer goods, I think, mm -hmm. uh, right? If it's family photos and that sort of thing. Right. Now, I'd say out of the gate, if it's somebody who hires you to make pick, to do pictures for their business, then it's probably not a consumer good. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you, you get out of that boat. Consumer goods are generally things for family or household purposes, not for business purposes. Um, so that's sort of one key point. It's got to be over $25. I presume uh, most photographers Majority, are yes. over $25. Mm -hmm. So that's probably not going to be a way out. Um, could be many or, or many contracts or one contract. Uh, and here's the key. The seller or his representative personally solicits the sale, including those in response to or following an invitation by the buyer, and the buyer's agreement or offer to purchase is made at a place other than the place of the business of the seller. Now, we'll get more into it, but... Um, if you don't have a fixed location, and Rachel advised me that, and I know that's too, I've worked with photographers, that is very common. The photographers work out of their home, and many businesses work out of their homes. So um, that is going to put you more under the purview of this sort of act. Um, you're going to be regulated. Now, there's a list of exceptions, and there's a long list. I want to focus in on a couple that I think will give photographers uh, some respite. And, and generally speaking, um, Generally speaking, my opinion is that photographers can probably generally be exempt from this. And the reason why you want to be exempt from this is that um, so you'll have the, the whole point is if, if you are falling under this, the federal act requires you to do two things. It requires you to notify people of a right to cancellation, mm -hmm. give them a cancellation form, and then they have three days to cancel, uh, cancel it. Um, I think there's some basically... It's tricky because if they purchased a product from you, a tangible good, they have to return it. The problem is, is you're not, photographers are not probably producing a tangible good, at least not at first. You know, eventually the photographs come later. So you probably, if if you are under this, you're going to mm -hmm. be out of luck when they say, give me my money back. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a big thing. But the exemptions, I think, are important. So there are a few different um exemptions. The first one that is important to note is if you have prior negotiations in the course of a visit by the buyer to a retail business establishment having a fixed permanent location where the goods or services are offered. Um, so obviously that's not going to apply to everyone, but if you have a fixed location and somebody visits it and then you go to their home, you, you ought to be exempt under that um, part one. That's well, let me ask you this then, and we kind of mentioned this. Some photographers, they're regular, it's not a retail place of business, but they always meet their clients at Starbucks. I mean, is that helpful in any form or fashion if they end up doing it there? I mean, it may not be a retail business. That, that's a good point, Rachel. And I'll always qualify this with all of these things I'm saying are obviously in generalities. So mm -hmm. it's always a case by case thing. There's a lot of case law on this subject, I'm sure, especially at the federal level. Um, so, you know, ultimately I'd love to have a, a case that says, what does retail business establishment right. mean? 
But my impression is that retail business establishment means a fixed, traditional, Agreed. commercially zoned right location, not a house. That's the reason why you're saying that. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you wouldn't say that term to begin with. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think so. So I, I think um, now when we get – I'll keep it split up. But if you get into something like Virginia's law, Virginia's law is actually – much more um, protective of the business person. So Virginia's law doesn't make that distinction. Virginia's law just says if you engage in any negotiations between the, um, the four services are provided at the home, then you're exempt, which is great. See, but and that can't. right there is why I, from, from the very beginning, and, and this is something that Andrew and I should said at the beginning, it, lawyers, we're taught to be able to argue either side of it. I mean, we try to read the law as much as possible. The case law is out there. So, but for me, I really think, based on what Andrew just said, and that's Virginia state law, every state law may be um, a little different, but for us, we're not these door-to-door salesmen. We're not just showing up and jumping into somebody's house and selling them pictures. We have done previous transaction and and negotiations with the people. They had to inquire, they had to book, we had to have session, we had to set up the time. Um, And so I feel like, and I don't, Andrew, I I believe that, hopefully that you'll agree when I say this, is that I don't think that we're, that this, like we said at the very beginning, this was to protect consumers against like the door-to-door vacuum type salesman. No offense to anybody that sells vacuums, Uh, but that's when what this was really to protect. And if you have engaged in these negotiation discussions with clients and met with them previously and talked about potential products, you're really backing off of that high pressure sales session. There you have had opportunities to think and the buyer has, has had opportunities to think and discuss um, and weren't blindsided by your sales at that point. I agree, Rachel, and and I'll mention. So let me note. So this this is a good segue into the other ex, one of the other exemptions I wanted to highlight. This is again, this is federal law. So this is something everybody has to comply with. So this is Part A four says you're exempt if you conducted and consummated entirely by mail or telephone mm-hmm. and without any other contact between the buyer and the seller or its representative prior to delivery of the goods or performances performance of the services. So in the photography business, um, this is I think really key. Anyone will be exempt if you follow that stricture. So that means you have a telephone or mail-based. Co- I mean, who's going to do it by mail? So let's just say tel- <laughs> carrier pigeon. <laughs> and I think mail probably. I think we can fairly construe mail to mean include email. Agreed. So if you have conversations by those methods of communication, mm-hmm. okay, so importantly, those methods of communication are not face-to-face communication. And I think that's done purposefully based upon what Rachel described was the intent of the law. So if you do those things and you enter into a contract, and now when I say contract, I'm sure Rachel's told you all a lot about this. It's a big <laughs> subject for another day. My reputation of, goes before me. <laughs> right. There's a lot of ways to enter into a contract, but importantly, right, mm-hmm. it does not necessarily mean a written contract. Right. Obviously, you might not have something in writing at that stage. That's okay. I think you can have an agreement that's enforceable in court without having something signed in in writing. Um, a lot of discussion there beyond the scope of what we're talking about. But so going back to it, so mail or telephone, mm-hmm. uh, you do that and you have, um, and so you have an understanding. So it's, so the, basically it doesn't even say you have a contract. It says mm-hmm. basically that the sale is conducted and consummated. So you have some general agreement about what's going to occur and then you go provide the services you're exempt. And, and I believe that a reasonable person is going to understand from mm-hmm. your discussions and bookings, they're going to a reasonable person is going to understand and expect to receive and purchase images in the end. Yeah, exactly. I agree, and I and I think it, I don't even I think to be safe, I'd say, and I would think this is a good business practice too, right? When you have that phone conversation, you're going to tell people you're going to pay me a certain amount of money, and in mm-hmm. exchange, I'm going to uh, show up to your home or wherever it may be take so many pictures or for a certain period of time, Mm -hmm. you know, you might want to discuss too about the rights you might be giving those folks. Uh, And and if that's the sort of discussion you're having, I think you fall under this exemption. I think arguably you probably might still fall under the exemption, even if you don't have, get into some of the specifics like about ownership or maybe even price, arguably, but you're definitely Mm -hmm. in riskier territory uh, at that point. So 
Uh, that's my thought on that exemption. Well, I agree because I think about 99.9%, unless you have a retail business, even I have a retail photograph photography studio, but I have only ever had one person in a year and a half ever stop by to want to get pictures and we didn't even engage in the transaction because I'm by appointment only. So I think the majority of portrait photographers that are listening to this, probably 99.9% .9 of them get their inquiries by that electronic communication. I mean, so you've had some discussion and meeting of the minds, so to speak, prior to the sale even beginning. Exactly, exactly. And that, I think you're, you're, you're pretty good. But like I said, so that's more restrictive. Those are the only two, there are other exemptions, mm -hmm. but they, they're not going, they're, they're, they're things like, there's one exemption, for instance, about uh, purchases of products made for emergency purposes, which are obviously not going to apply to photographers. So <laughs> I, I've highlighted the two. So those were parts one and four of, of that section I mentioned before, six, Title 16 of the Code of Federal Regulations, Section 429, Part A, Part 1, and Part 4, if you are so inclined to look them up. And I think that covers what you're obligated to do under federal law. Um, but I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, I transition, if, if you like, uh, Rachel, yeah, I'm, to discuss yes. uh, Virginia law I highlighted. I'll mention, it, it's very, I'm glad, Rachel, you mentioned, uh, you know, obviously every state's law or jurisdiction, you know, U.S. territories as well, are, are going to be different. Um, so what I say, what Rachel and I discussed may not be applicable to you in your state and, you know, uh, we can figure out if it is. That said, uh, generally speaking, uh, I would probably say most or all states have a law similar to I what agree. we discuss. Yeah. Um, and generally speaking, and this is one I have, okay, I, no, I, I don't, I've never personally litigated this particular act. It's called the let me make sure I get it right. The Virginia Home Solicitation Sales Act. However, it is tied to something called the Virginia Consumer Protection Act, which any business litigator has probably litigated in Virginia. And there's <laughs> the Corollary Act, I'm sure, in probably every state. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're, they are, we're learning new ones every day. So the Virginia Consumer Protection Act has a list of something like 30 things expressly in that act that might violate it, and it's a lot of stuff. And then they have, what they do is they have other acts that basically say, here's another thing we're going to police, and if you violate it, you will be punished as if you had violated the Virginia Consumer Protection Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, so that's what, this, this, that's what this act does. Um, and so it's interesting, uh, when Rachel asked me about this, I looked this up, and sure enough, I found this one. Um, and, and it was right there. They have a they have a laundry list. Here, this it basically says here are these other code sections that the Consumer Protection Act might apply to. So the Home Solicit Solicitation Sales Act has a similar definition to a home solicitation sale, um, but it's like I said, it's it's much more protective. I can tell of business persons. That surprises me actually to know that Virginia protects the business a little bit more than the consumer. Hmm. I guess, you know, that it's a good point. It depends what the business is, it seems. It mm -hmm. depends what the, I'll be cynical about it, it probably depends upon what uh, particular lobbyist was in whatever. <laughs> yes. Year at the time. So, it, you know, it, you know it, you're right, Rachel. It depends, but it, I've seen some terribly unfavorable business uh, laws in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And I've seen others that are very favorable. One that I'm not to throw in a, a big aside, but one I've commonly seen is, uh, larceny in Virginia. Larceny has been, and I talk about this all the time, has been $200 um, is the line between a misdemeanor and felony larceny. Larceny is just a theft of something for a very mm -hmm. long time. And the common, um, the common knowledge of that amongst Virginia lawyers is that it's been that way because every time someone tries to, tries to change it, the business lobby gets up in arms and so it never gets changed. Um, so it depends. But aside that aside, um, so if we look at a solicitation sale, and the code section here is the Virginia Code, and that's section 59.1-21.2. Again, I said I'd tell you some boring, uh, some boring uh, numbering uh, that you pay us lawyers to look up for you. It's good for anybody mm -hmm. who wants to go read it themselves. Yeah, exactly. And there's a few sections. This one's the definition. So home solicitation sale means a consumer sale or lease of goods or services in which the seller or a person acting for him engages in... Uh, one, in a personal solicitation of the sale or lease, or two, in a solicitation of the sale or lease by telephonic or other electronic means at any residence other than that of the seller. That's very broad. 
However, there are exceptions that are very helpful to the business person. The chief exceptions, if you read on later, I'm not gonna read verbatim, are, again, you see for some reason that $25 rule is propagated everywhere. So it has to be over $25. Um, and then there are two key exceptions we'll talk about here um, that are gonna be a, somewhat same, similar in some respects to the federal rule we just talked about and different in some respects. The first is a sale or lease made pursuant to a pre-existing revolving charge account. And the second, probably more applicable, is a sale or lease made pursuant to prior negotiations mm -hmm. between the parties. That one, that second one, I, it would seem to me, will exempt most or all people, and like I said, more easily than the federal rule. So if you have any prior negotiation, in person or not, and then you have a second visit, I interpret this to mean that that second visit is now not subject uh, to the act. And I mean, could that be as simple as you emailing me saying you want pictures for your family, me sending you the booking link with the pricing and information, and you filling it in? I mean, could it be as simplistic as that as considering a prior negotiation? Yes. Okay. I agree. And any discussion generally, uh, I would interpret a negotiation very broadly. I, think I agree. I think you'd always want... I want I want two I want two communications that is because negotiation I think has to include two to, uh, communications mm -hmm. I agree communication can include your own pricing list it doesn't have to be a formal discussion with mm -hmm. um, but and yeah. I think that's where a lot of people have gotten tripped up when they've come to me is that uh, they think that it has to be like this if they've read this far into it, is that they're like, oh, all this negotiations. Well, you're not really, it's not negotiation in the way that I think many photographers and creative businesses, you're not negotiating like prices. We I mean, just negotiation would be like the communication of how much they're going to pay, how much, what you're going to give. Um, I, yeah, exactly mm -hmm. right. And I think I, I would interpret it, tend to interpret it very broadly, although, although I should be fair to, to piggyback what you're saying off before, there is a section, since this is a Consumer Protection Act violation, there is a section that was just, very recently litigated, in fact, by a, a colleague uh, that went to uh, our, our law school at the Virginia Supreme Court. And Virginia's, Virginia's Consumer Protection Act says it should be construed where possible in favor of the consumer. And mm. I would venture most other states' acts say the same thing. Mm -hmm. But that being said, that's usually only you um, fall back on something like that as a lawyer when there's some ambiguity about what things might mean. And I think negotiation, I agree uh, with what Rachel said, definitely. If you have a discussion that says, here's what the price is going to be, uh, I don't think you, a negotiation doesn't mean you actually reach an agreement. Even. It just means you discussed it. I think. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think, arguably, obviously, the more terms you discuss, the better. But like I said, it, it could be something as simple as, I will provide you the following services, um, and you come in my house, and you might be able to get away with talking about things uh, at the physical location. To protect you, mm -hmm. I would say you definitely want to talk about more terms rather than less to make sure you fall under this exemption before you make that personal visit to the Well, home. and a copy of an electronic contract could basically do that communication for you, the contract yes. that's actually getting you booked. Definitely, definitely. See, I couldn't let that one pass me by. <laughs> no, I, no, I think that's, that's a good point, Rachel. And I'm, I'm thinking too, because, you know, when we're getting in, you, surprisingly enough, we know this, but it's a very common, it's a very common precept in the law and amongst lawyers that you don't have to negotiate all terms for there to be a contract. Right. And in fact, that can include things like price, which surprises many people. Mm -hmm. But if price is not discussed, then the law usually, depending upon the circumstances, infers a reasonable price, like the fair yeah. market rate for your services in that area. Um, so, yeah, but I agree. Uh, yeah, sending a written contract along or at least discussing all the terms, saying, you know, ideally from a whole bigner planning perspective, I'd want a client to have a at least have a full discussion and then followed by a signed written contract. Mm -hmm. Failing that, I'd like a full written discussion by email with some with the customer saying at the end, yes, I agree to your terms. Mm -hmm. uh, that's ideal for more than just this law. Um, and yeah, but, but Rachel, you're right. It, it, I think there's a lot of different ways under this Virginia law we're talking about that you can be exempt. Um, and I mentioned, too, I suppose it's possible, probably not a preferred model of charging people, but it's possible that you might have a pre-existing revolving charge account with people. I think that envisions if you had a circumstance where, I'm thinking especially if you are a photographer maybe with a contract with a business entity, 
that you would you would avoid all this stuff. Although I should say too, although business is already going to be exempt because that's not a consumer sale. Mm-hmm. Right. right. So, um, but yeah, that's. Uh, but let me maybe I should give you the scary stuff too, since I did tell you it was the consumer. That covers basically how you're going to fall under this act. But if you were to actually fall under that. Then here's the scary thing. So Consumer Protection Act violation in Virginia, and I, like I said, I know Virginia is not the only one with this sort of act, is um, can subject you to civil liability, and it's more severe than just rescission. So you could have rescission like we had before, uh, where, where the person could rescind the contract and ask for their money back. Mm-hmm. But if it's a violation, you're actually allowed to, if it's a, I'll focus especially on a willful violation, you're given... Um, let's see, statutory damages of up to $1,000. That means it doesn't matter what the person is actually damaged. They could get up to $1,000 for a willful violation. A non-willful violation is $500 plus attorney's fees, which will probably be more than $500. Mm-hmm. <laughs> plus, now that I told you it's statutory. If the actual damage exceeds that, now I could think of some harebrained scheme, but let's just suppose somebody says, you know, I lost and can plausibly say I lost five thousand dollars because of the because of your scam which is what they're basically saying if you fall into this ad um that um not to say any photographer would be right right it's meant to to cover so let's suppose you lost you know they say i lost five thousand dollars and they'd have to explain how that is and there's a lot of caveats to that but if that's true if it's willful if you willfully violate this act uh virginia multiplies it by three so five thousand wow yeah, and like I said, I think that's fairly common amongst many states. So right. Surprise me, there are other states out there with similar laws. So, you know, that's a big deal. So you, you really don't want to uh, fall under this act to begin with. But I think the good news is, I mean, we've kind of well established and beaten it down for them that photographers probably pretty unless you're just gonna you like you show up and paparazzi someone at their front door, then try to sell them the images right then. We're pretty well protected with the prior negotiations exception. Yes, I think so, Rachel. I think the thing to avoid is like you just described. If you knock on somebody's door and then sell the services right then and there mm-hmm. and then provide them, you, you know, you're gonna fall under this Virginia Act if you're in Virginia. And in fact, uh, the FTC regulation, likewise, you'll fall under that and you probably fall under it even if you came back later and provided the services at some later time. Mm-hmm. It's really trying to regulate this continuous door-to-door high-pressure sales atmosphere. So I'd say just avoid that entirely. Well, let me ask you one other situation because I kind of was thinking, what if a wedding photographer is at an expo? But it's a wedding expo, so a reasonable judge is going to say that a person going to an expo uh, that is a wedding one to meet vendors is going with the intention to secure services. We would be completely exempt at that point, right? I mean, if they signed a contract with me that day, uh, would the cooling off rule still apply? I mean, I'm not in my retail business. We haven't had prior negotiations. Okay, uh, let's see. So if you were in Virginia, no sweat. You had, you had. Um, I think that's okay, right? No, now hold on. So just to clarify the hypothetical, uh, Rachel, mm-hmm. so you, you did have some discussion at the, the wedding. Um, at the expo. they We talked at the booth, and then they signed the contract. Yeah, so you're definitely out of the water on the um, uh, on a state law like Virginia's. Then now on the federal rule, let me refer back to law just so I make sure, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to say that I think you're also going to be exempt there. But let me I think just from the fact that a, a yeah. reasonable person going to a wedding uh, vendor – fair is going with the intention to enter. It wasn't like they were blindsided when they're making cookies and the doorbell rings and the vacuum guy walks in. I, I agree with you there, Rachel. And my only, because I'll be the strict statutory guy. Then, yes. Uh, of course, I always <laughs> want to remember, even though we know the purpose of the law, that's right. not necessarily what controls the relationship. But I think, um, you know, that's interesting that you brought that up. There might be an issue there. Remember, we talked about the two exemptions in the federal Mm-hmm. A federal act. All right. So one is made pursuant to prior negotiations in the course of the visit by the buyer to a regional business establishment having a fixed permanent location. If you don't have a fixed permanent location, uh, then no matter where this discussion takes place, that exemption won't work. Mm-hmm. Uh, number four, we talked about before, conducted and consummated entirely by entirely by mail or mm-hmm. telephone without any other contact between the buyer and the seller or its representative prior to delivery of the goods or performance of the mm. services. I think you have a problem there. You're not going to be exempt under that exemption. Right. 
because you obviously had face-to-face -face Unless they had happened to inquire before and then came to see you at the expo. Maybe, except, I agree, except that you have to have consummated before the expo. Ah, uh, yes, that's to true. Fall under, to fall under that exemption. Um, there are exemptions for initiating, con sellers initiating, uh, excuse me, buyer initiating contact, but that exemption applies expressly for uh, asking for maintenance upon personal property. So that's mm -hmm. like calling up uh, a, a plumber and asking you to come over and then you consummate the transaction there. That's exempting like a plumber or other maintenance person. The mm -hmm. photographer would not be a person performing maintenance on personal property. So you know what? Just based upon the exemptions we talked about today, the scenario you just described, I think I'm going to have to say there's there's risk there at the very least. See, and that's, as we were sitting here talking, I was trying, since we had established that we pretty much think the majority of photographers, it wouldn't apply. So I was racking my brain while you were talking, trying to think of a situation. And that's, that is one. I mean, because it's a very potential thing that brides can get caught up at a fair, sign all these contracts, and then turn around and cancel them. Like, as we just saw that the law is not going to apply. Um, I guess that but would that spiral into more? What if you signed with somebody, um, you reserve that date, then another bride came along to sign a contract for the same date, and you told her no because you had already committed to this other person. But then, you know, the person that you, bride A, that you committed to mm -hmm. cancels within the three days. I mean, is there anything you can do at that point? I, I'm, I'm, that's a good, very good question, Rachel. I, we can I, leave that for another, maybe a yeah, follow-up. These, <laughs> these are like, I always, I always like to say to like everything I'm saying, not legal advice always depends upon the circumstances. Correct. The yeah. Jurisdiction. Oh, they've yeah. heard that plenty from me. I say yeah. that all the time. <laughs> but so yeah, you know, I, I would just, I would, I would label that right now, that scenario we described as problematic. And right. the worst of it is, is the door to door sale is not really described as a door to door sale, unfortunately. Yeah. So, it, it the it, the title is door to door sale, but as a matter of what we it's talk about, sales. we're talking about construction, mm -hmm. how to read a statute. You usually don't really give much weight or any weight to the title, title or, right. or the stated purpose. I think that it's, just gives a nod to the original intention, but not um, what's the word? Not indicative of what it is confined to. Exactly, but it says in here. It says so. It says you're going to have a consumer good or services with a purchase price of twenty. Five dollars or more, in which the seller or his representative personally solicits the sale, including those in response to or following an invitation by the buyer, and the buyer's agreement or offer to purchase is made at a place other than the place of business of the seller. Mm -hmm. So that's not, you know, we talked about well, the purpose is to regulate door to door sales, except that now it says any place other than. Right. The, locate, the place of business of the seller, which means a lot of places other than door-to-door -door places. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that includes wedding uh, events and wedding, um, or, you know, wedding expos. Um, I mean, that I, right there, I just think, is exactly why this whole thing has been confusing. Because we don't, <laughs> many photographers don't have a single, it's wherever we land is where we work. <laughs> You know, I, I would say, you know, get get some good counsel from Rachel. Obviously, you know, somebody like me, but not yeah. Say if I can't one. answer, I send everyone to Andrew. So yeah, <laughs> but but you know what though is the issue is you're going to have other regulatory burdens if, if you if you fall under it, then you you know the federal law regulation requires you, like we said before, to have a written cancellation form that you right. supply to these people and that you basically advise them of their right to cancel. Uh, and if you don't do that, I have not researched this, so yeah. I'm just saying this is qualified. But it would wouldn't surprise me if there if there's not just the rescission, but there are other. Usually, there are civil penalties involved with FTC violations. In other words, the attorney general or somebody acting from the Justice Department could conceivably fine you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would suspect, but I'm not sure that that's in here. Um, so uh, I'll just throw that out there too. That that then there's going to be other compliance beyond the fact that whenever you deal with a federal law, you're just going to have a bunch of compliance that you, I try to plan my clients around so mm -hmm. you don't have to comply because usually it's going to be kind of burdensome. It's usually how it goes. So, yeah, but that I think that delves a lot in the issue. But that's a good hypothetical, Rachel. I'm sure we could think of others that would be... I mean, I could sit here and come up with hypotheticals all day. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, well, I think we pretty well covered it. I mean, I... 
uh, my, the biggest thing for bringing this to you guys is to make sure that we're following the letter of the law. I've had a lot of questions, a lot of people proposing different situations, but the, the way that Andrew outlined it, and I just kind of wanted to bring him in since he's the individual that litigates this sort of stuff, I try to help you guys prevent it, but if you ever get to something, he's the one that does litigation. It's really good to have another perspective for y'all to kind of get this uh, two-sided, which we ended up agreeing on the majority of this, which actually makes me feel real good that I kind of have a well, little... Well, I expect this. Got, Rachel's got a very good head about it. <laughs> a little, little seal of approval, but I think that's fantastic. Uh, but yeah, definitely, if you guys, if especially if you're in the Virginia area, if you have any questions or anything as far as a client issue, Andrew's the one that I would send to if you guys have any other questions about the, this cooling off rule um, in federal it's three days correct Andrew it was 72 yeah, hours three days in the yep. state Virginia law we're talking is also three days and so uh, the federal law only came into existence I believe in 2009 so I think the federal law is modeled after some states law mm -hmm. so I bet you it's three days in most or I've seen a couple states that were two days but not very many the majority were pretty much in line with the with the three days uh, mm -hmm. but if you guys have any questions uh, you can stick it into the comments below. Um, I'm also going to link, like I said, Andrew's website. Uh, lots of information. Um, you guys could reach out there to get some more. And I'm sure that we could always do a follow-up if there's enough questions yeah, as well. Yeah, I'd love to. Whatever you can go. I, I love uh, talking to Rachel and, and answering your questions. And this is the sort of stuff. In fact, we have – I'll have to give a shameless plug. We have a, go for a, it. a new office in Richmond. <gasps> and, do you? Uh, Yes, the, the, we have two attorneys there, and uh, they're they're both uh, women, not to be sexist, but uh, one of them in particular is very keyed into uh, uh, the wedding industry and photography Perfect. in and around Richmond, and so this is sort of becoming a niche practice for us, especially in the Richmond area. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Cool. That just like opened the world for me because Blacksburg's <laughs> a little far for me to go, but Richmond's yeah. uh, Richmond's so even closer. Me. Manassas, right? Yeah. Very cool. All right. Awesome. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for everything. Again, guys, if you have any questions, stick them in the comments, shoot them to me, or you can shoot them to Andrew. And I hope that this has helped you guys be able to clear the air, know that you're pretty well covered, um, that when people make that sale, that's it. Final sale. They know it's done, um, unless we've got these little exceptions. But other than that, I think you guys are good to go. So thanks, Andrew. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. I appreciate you having me.